we started last week on sharing on remembrance and I said what you remember from your past you bring into your present and into your future and the most important thing that we need to remember is God or I would say the most important person that we always need to remember is God please note it down the most important most critical personality that we need to remember in our lives is God. Why so? Because God, please write it down, God is your creator and your sustainer. He's the one who creates you or created you and he's the one who can sustain you. Nobody else can. Nobody else can create you. The world with all this knowledge in recent times is creating robots that almost look like human beings but they are nothing like what God has created. They can malfunction at any time. You know the world is eventually going to be taken over by robots. What you call artificial intelligence. Uh, that's, the world, that's the system we're getting into. That is humanity, as God's word said, that in the last days, knowledge shall increase. And because knowledge has increased, men want to seem to com compete with God, but will never get there. So you need to know, the most critical person you need to remember in your life and destiny is God, because he's your creator and your sustainer. He's also your provider. He can provide for you what nobody else can provide. Fact is, he can provide more for you than your boyfriend. Or the, or the opposite. Yes. Because some, some people, okay, I won't say what I'm about to say. But to, today, I want to share particular dimensions of God for which reason we need to remember him. And from that, we're going to read scripture in Exodus chapter 33. Exodus 33. Thank you, Lord. From the verse 12 through to verse 19. And I'll share my pointers with you. The revelational insight that God wants us to have. Number one. This was when God was ready to continue the journey with the children of Israel through the wilderness to the promised land. Note it very carefully. He was taking them. He has taken them from bondage and captivity. Just like he has rescued you. I mean not everybody is rescued though. There are people still living in the kingdom of darkness because their lives have not been surrendered to Jesus. There are people still living in the world and they think the world is the place to be. But every now and then they feel religious so you want to be in church. But it's not like that. If your life is not surrendered to Jesus, you are living under the control of the devil. You are under the power of darkness. And if you don't repent now, it's only a matter of time. The devil will take your life like that and plant you in hell where he's going eventually. But when you surrender your life to Jesus, he translates you from the prison of the kingdom of darkness into his kingdom of light where you will find salvation and eternity with Christ Jesus and God our Father. I hope you get it. So it's important for us to always remember that our life must be lived under the governance of Jesus Christ. And when we remember that, that's what he does for us or with us on the journey of life. Because whether you like it or not, every single one of us, we are on a journey. You were born. Your journey even started from, from the womb. Last, last week I showed you that the reason why you are alive today is because you're a winner. Because before you were conceived, out of millions of spermatozoa, you were the one that succeeded. Because more than... Doc, how many spermatozoa is released per time at ejaculation? Approximate. 45 million. He's a gynecologist, so he knows what he's talking about. I mean, in school, in science school, they taught us the same. But I'm like, the number is too much. Because even one million is plenty. But 45 million spermatozoa, they look like small snakes. So you used to be a snake. <laughs> Listen, they're, 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 but you can't see, what is amazing is that you can't see them with the naked eye. In the natural, they look like a, oh Lord help me, just send them. They, they look like a can of a, 
No, 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 no. I mean, like with the physical eye, it looks like just a, a glass or maybe just a mess of um, condensed milk. What the bad people are thinking. May the Lord have mercy on you. <laughs> but here, but when you look at them at, under microscope, you see many, many, they're like tadpoles. You know, like a frog when it's in, it, at the stage of growing and maturing. Plenty. 45 million of them and you won. All of them chasing one egg and you won. So you should know that God has a purpose for your life. Don't let anybody take you down. So, but then how you progress in this life is by having the understanding that your life must be lived in total submission to God. That's it. So, once you have that understanding on your journey of life, because your journey started from the womb, you came out from the womb, now you are alive, you're growing. Some of you have growing beer beer. I don't want to describe the way your own looks, but you have grown hair in all kinds of places. Which makes you think that you have grown. We will leave that for another matter. <laughs> but here, it is all about, don't ever get to the point where you think you are too big for God to direct. That's a dangerous place to be. Don't ever think you are too educated to submit to God. Don't ever think that you become too wealthy or powerful or influential or more connected for God to direct you. That's dangerous. So Israel was on the journey. And Moses said, God told him, you know, these people, they are very, very stubborn, very, very rebellious. So I'm thinking of finishing all of them. Then I will start a new generation with you. If you were Moses, what would you say? <laughs> Somebody say hallelujah. If you were Moses, that, because you see, if I was Moses, I would remember that these people at the Red Sea, they wanted to stone me. They wanted to kill me. <laughs> So now that God himself wants to finish them, I say, God, yeah, we agree. We shake hands. Finish them. Let's go. But no, 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 no. Because there was something about God's presence that he knew he can count on once God agrees to go with them. So he said, don't, don't look at these people because if you look at them and their behavior, you will let the worldly people whom you saved them from think that you couldn't take care of them. You know, that's what the devil tells you sometimes. Say, when you live, the devil makes you think that when you leave the world and the things of the world, when you come to God, you can't, he can't take care of you. That's a lie. When you leave all the things, all the negative, filthy, corrupt lifestyles of the world and you come to God and surrender to him, he can, he can take care of you. Fact is, he can do more than anybody can ever do for you in this life. And God wants us to have that understanding. So Moses went into a conversation with God. He said, Moses said to the Lord, look, look, you to have told me, lead these people up and you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You said, I know you by name and you have also found favor in my sight. Because in his mind, he thought God was going to leave to his earlier promise that he will finish the people and then he will carry on with him. So he had to bring God into remembrance. I mean, even God also wants to be reminded. Oh, yeah. So, remember as a very powerful virtue. Now, go on to verse 13. Let me show you something. Go on to verse 13. It says, please, I beg you, give me my King James. Leave me alone with this. Uh, this is, give my King James. It says, now therefore, I pray thee, if I found grace in your sight, show me now the way, thy way that I may know thee that I, I may also find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. So you see the remembrance God is, uh, Moses was bringing to God. He says, if I have truly found grace in your sight, then show me your way. Everybody that remembers God, God shows him his way. I'll give you the pointers. You just wait yet. I want to read through the scripture entirely till the verse 19. So let's go on. Verse 14, he says, Verse 14. Then he said, my presence shall go with you and I will give you rest. Can we read together? He says, and he said, my presence shall go with you and I will give you rest. Then verse 15, Moses responded and said, and he said unto him, if your presence go not with me, carry us up, not hands. If your presence doesn't come with us, then don't make us move. 
verse 16 he says go on for wherein shall it be known here that i and your people have found grace in your sight is it not that you go with us so shall we be separated separated mean distinguished peculiar greater or more than the ordinary people i and your people from all the people that are upon the face of the earth you see it the extinction i'll give you the pointers just relax verse 17 he says and the lord said unto moses i will do this thing also that you have spoken for you have found grace in my sight and i know you by name i know you by name does god know your name how many of you believe god knows your name and you know that he knows you for who you truly are. Not who you are pretending to be. Oh yeah, yeah. He knows every secret about you. Fact is, if he decides to play it on the video, on this screen. Some people will die of heart attack in the church. Out of shock and price and pressure. That's why he keeps his secret. But you know, those things he's recording about you, they will be played in heaven. Oh yeah. There are books. If you read the book of Revelation, the books will be opened. Everything you are doing under the sun, when your conscious is awake, everything is recorded. And they will play it for you. And you know what, is, what will be funny? In heaven, before they dispatch you either to heaven or to hell, when they are showing your video, everybody else will be watching all your friends <laughs> and your enemies, they'll be watching. Now he says, and the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing that you have spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. Verse 18, go on quickly. And he said, I beseech you, show me your glory. Now in verse 19, and that's where I close it, and then I'll give you the pointers what I want to go. So I'm going to run through really fast. 19, can we read together? It says, and he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. You should clap your hands for Jesus. So in God's dealing with people, there are those he will show grace. And grace is unmerited favor that will carry your life beyond your natural capacity and ability. And then there are those he will show mercy just to preserve your life. But you get very little. Mercy eh? blocks or intervenes in the judgment of God upon your life for what you actually deserve. Just to preserve you to see whether you will change. You have a change of mind and change your heart and surrender it to God. That's what mercy does. Hallelujah. I, I pray to God that you get this revelation. Now write this down. Let me give you the pointers and we'll run. When God gives, me, gives us the opportunity... I pray to God that we'll break it down further. Write it down. Number one, remembering and acknowledging God. Remembering and acknowledging God, the creator and sustainer and helper brings him into your present and future for your good. I will say that again. Don't worry. Remembering and acknowledging God, the creator and sustainer and helper brings him into your present and future life for your good in your journey of life. So once you remember him as your creator, as your sustainer, and as your helper, you bring his presence with you into your present life and your future for your good. On your journey of life. Because I said, every one of us, we're on a journey. You're on a journey. Your journey can either be successful or a failure, depending on whether you're walking with God or walking with yourself. You know, some people are walking by themselves. They don't listen to no instruction. They don't listen to correction. They don't like rebuke. They don't like teaching. They know everything. They are God unto themselves. They are the sovereign God. Somebody was singing this song. Um, I mean, it's very popular. It has a bit of Igbo and English as well. 
Okay, kueme, kueme. And the last part is that we are the living God. Oh. <laughs> you are that kind of person. You, know, you should know who is in charge of your life. When you remember that he created you for a purpose and he's the only one who can help you and sustain you, you will carry him into your present life and into your future. And there's no way you can fail if God is with you. Apostle says, if God be for us, who can be against us? But why, is, why will he be with you? Why will he be with you on your journey? Because whether you like it or not, you're on the journey. And then let me bring that dimension as well. You're in a battle. Every Christian is in a battle. Whether you lose the battle or win the battle depends on whether you are walking with God and you truly acknowledge him or see him every day. Everything you do, you acknowledge his presence. That's point number one. Number two. Write this down. Number two. The presence of God is critical to every Christian. The presence of God is critical to every Christian. No substitute can replace God's presence in the genuine Christian's life and assignment and purpose. No substitute can replace God's presence or in the genuine Christian's life. His assignment and purpose. And so, as a Christian, you can't have substitute. Anything other than God is a, is a, is a mistake. Anything other than God's presence with you is a mistake. So, you find Christians... Going here and there. Chasing magicians who are pretending to be pastors or prophets. Going because they are looking for power, preservation, money, fame, power, fortune, whatever. Or they are looking for breakthroughs. So they run helter skelter. When you go to a place and the presence of God is not there, you must know. As a child of God. You must know. As a Christian, please note it down. You need to know how to discern your father's presence. You need to know. For those of you who are married or probably have siblings that you live together. Sometimes you may not be aware that your partner or your friend or whoever is in the house. But there's some, there's some fragrance that will begin to pass when you have not seen the person. You say, oh, I think my husband is around, my wife is around. Uh -huh. The Christian must have the same sensitivity about the presence of God. You know when God has arrived. You know where he is there. And you know how to relate with him. That's how he will guide you. Because when you are unable to discern his presence, you will be the loser at the end. So it's, it's important. So can't, don't replace God's presence with any other thing. There's no substitute to God's presence. Every child of God needs it. That's why Moses said, if your presence will not go with us, don't make us take one step from here. It's not as if they might not be able to know how to navigate the wilderness, but he knows that God's presence means everything. His presence means fire to give them light in the night time and to give them warmth. His presence also was cloud, a pillar of cloud for them that will shield them from the heat. And then his presence also ensured that everything they needed in the wilderness is provided for. And when they were confronted by enemy forces, God's presence gave them victory. So every genuine Christian, God's presence ha must have no substitute in your life. This was why David said in Psalm 51, he says, take not your Holy Spirit from me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. He knows the weight of when God's presence leaves him. He becomes an ordinary man. But when God is with him, he becomes a very dangerously strange, powerful man. Same as you and I. Without God's presence, we're weaklings. But with God's presence, we become dormitably powerful. Too powerful for the enemy to handle. That's why they will see, I mean, if, you know, for some of us, because we, God gave us grace to enjoy power at a very young age, you know what it means when you are 20 year old or 21 demonstrating the apostolic power in miracles and people who are of the opposite world kind of tell, uh, where, where did you get that? <laughs> they see you demonstrate raw power. 
and they are wondering, how did you get it? Because somebody like you should encourage it. But in this atmosphere and what God is doing in this dispensation, I pray that the Lord will overflow your life with fresh power and fire that will make you demonstrate the anointing and the power of the Holy Ghost everywhere you are. You will carry it into every space of your destiny. On your every journey, you will manifest it. And God's glory will show. Because that is what his presence does. When God's presence is with you, there must be evidence. You must have testimonies. Of what his power is doing. That's why you can't afford to have substitute. Hallelujah. I share this last two with you. Now, number three. Number three or four. Now, the presence with you means confirmation that God knows you by name. The presence of God with you means the confirmation that God knows you by name. Purpose and assignment. Because God knows you by name. That's what he told Moses. I know your name. I know your name. The presence of God with you means the confirmation that God knows you by name. Purpose and assignment. Please write it down. This is because he made you and gifted you and assigned and commissioned you. For what you need to do for his kingdom. This is because he made you, gifted you, assigned and commissioned you for what you need to do for his kingdom, progress and enlargement. Question is, are you committed to this purpose? Are you committed to this purpose? Look at what God did with Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1, we'll jump the, the verses, so please pay attention. Verse number 1, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse number 5, verse number 6 to 10, and then verse number 18 and 19. Let me show you something. Jeremiah chapter 1, that's because the presence of God with you means the confirmation that he knows you by name, purpose, assignment. Because he made you and gifted you for what you need to do for his kingdom progress and enlargement. Now, let's read it quickly. The verses as I gave, let's read them. It says, before, this is what God was speaking to the prophet Jeremiah. He said, before, can we read? Before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. And before you came out, out of the womb, I sanctified you. And I ordained you a prophet unto the nations. Before, before he came out, before he was giving birth, God says he was a prophet. And you who are sitting here, alive already, you don't know the prophetic oil on your head. You don't know the grace that God has released for you. You are meant to probably be a president in this nation in some time to come. But your life looks so mediocre in your own sight. So you're wondering, how am I going to live it right? How will I fulfill it? Here now, this is what God says. He says, I ordained, I sanctified you, and I ordained you. When God ordains you, nobody can disappoint you. Once you walk with him. Because you will see God. He will pick people from nothing and raise them to be powerful people. That's, that's, that's his master work. That God is master as picking non-entities and making them great, relevant people. And I pray to God he will do the same for you and all yours. May you become great. May the Lord make you so great. May he make your children great and prominent and powerful in your generation. Verse 6 he says, go on, verse 6. Quickly please. Verse 6, he says, then he, then he said, I, our Lord God, behold, I cannot speak for I'm a child. When God said, I have ordained you and I've appointed you, he says, I'm a child. So see, you see, many times people forget who is talking to them. You're hearing God's word, but you think you're hearing a man. God is speaking to you, but you think you're listening to a man. And because of man's understanding, you're belittling yourself. He says, I'm a child. How can you ordain a, a child as a prophet? How can you ordain somebody who, doesn't, who can't speak well as a prophet? When God called Moses at age 80, he was still a stammerer. And God says, you are, you are going to be the prophet and the shepherd for these people to bring them out of captivity. God still chose him. So God looks beyond your incapacity and inabilities. 
and places himself upon you to fulfill purpose. Are you ready for it? Because that's where your real blessings will come from. That's where your blessings will become. That's where your relevance and your prominence will show. If you are not willing to commit to God's assignment, forget your future. Because you have no future without God. Note it down. You have no future without God. Go to verse 7 quickly. Again, God said, the Lord said unto him, Say not I'm a child, for thou shalt go. God says, don't say I'm a child. Don't limit yourself. Don't push yourself down. Allow me to do my work in you. For thou shalt go to all that I shall send you, and whatsoever I command you, you shall speak. Don't be afraid. Hallelujah. Verse 8. I like the last part to the verse 19. It says, be not afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, save the Lord. Don't be afraid. If God has called you, don't be afraid. You may be young, but he still called you. You can imagine when God called Samuel at age 5 to be prophet, to the senior most prophet in the land. As for God, there's sometimes he's play, he likes drama. He's better than cantata. Or the ones that you like to watch. Now he says in verse 9, verse 9, go on, please. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. So once you walk, want to walk, please write it down. What you need in order to grow and become strong is the word of God. If you want to walk with God, what you need is his word in order for you to grow spiritually and to become powerful. You need it. Hallelujah. Put his word in your mouth. Verse 10. Go on. Verse 10. Then he said, See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Oh my word. I pray to God that you catch this. God was talking to somebody who says, I'm a small boy. I cannot even talk. And God says, I have put you. I have set you over the nations. You sit here like this, looking like more brother. Do you believe that God has really put you over nations? Can you go speak to presidents? As I, right now, if I said, okay, God has opened door for us in uh, Czechoslovakia. Go and meet with the president and preach to him. How many of you can do? Not because you want to sit inside the airplane, no. But you can go and stand in front of the president of Czechoslovakia. Or no, better, the place I like, Saudi Arabia. Where the money is, the oil. So by the time you are preaching, you are looking for oil. Or the oil money. I mean, if you don't get the oil, you can get the money. But can you stand before such people? Now, now, not tomorrow. Because some of you, pray, okay, give me like some five, ten years. Over. No, no, no. Now. Because Jeremiah was limiting himself by his age and his inability to speak. But God says, I have set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out. This is both spiritual and physical kingdoms. So that what God, what God doesn't want, you uproot it. What he wants, you plant it. I pray to God that may that mantle come upon you. That everything in your household, in your family, in your bloodlines, everything that is not of God, by your presence there again, may they be uprooted in the name of Jesus. And may you plant God's presence and his blessing over your household, over your business, over your family, in your home, so that the devil will not come and terrorize you again. Hallelujah. That's what he wants us to be in charge and in absolute control. He says, I, I have put you over the kingdoms to root out, to pull out, and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. This year, you will build. Some people will build houses. You'll be shocked. Before the close of the year, land has arrived. And money to build your own home. You, you will stop renting house. I wish you could, you could catch it. Some people are afraid, of, you know. <laughs> Some people are afraid, hey, where is my money coming from? You know if you wait for money before you build a house, you will not build today. Some people even start and they build it. 30 years, the building is still standing. But some people too will start. Three months. Finish. Somebody started his house behind our house. Three months. Up. Because there's what? 
L'argent. Beaucoup l'argent. L'argent grand. That is what is going to enter your hand this year. The mo the mo you see money that will make you shake. It, it will make you think again about how you're going to manage your life. I remember watching one interview of Ali Kodangote, one of the richest men in Africa and the world at large. He said, he, he, you doing business, is making good money, but he always knew he had money, but it is only in the bank. So one day he decided to go and remove $10 million cash, brought it to his house and spread it on the floor and look at, look at how $10 million looks like. After he finished, he took it back to the bank. Because he knew he had money, but he never seen it before. So he just went to redraw this ten million dollars, spread it in his hall, and walk through. Just look at it. Oh, now I know I'm rich. <laughs> That's what he said. He said, "Now I know I'm rich." Before it was only the bank telling him the numbers. I pray to God, may you be overwhelmed with wealth. May the Lord raise you as a kingdom giant in this dispensation. May His manifest glory show forth around you in Jesus' mighty name. May you build and plant magnificent things to God's glory so that his honor will show forth everywhere you are in Jesus' mighty name.